go. Okay, today I have with me the great Tom Ahern. Uh, he was introduced to me via like, one of my clients, Jamie, who's possibly the tallest person I know, uh, the big giant. Great, great fella. Turns yes. Out friends uh, along the health and wellness journey, and we thought it'd be great to sit down and have a chat about wellness and everything that you're doing in your life at the moment. So do you want to just give us a bit of a, an intro into who you are and where you've been, where you've got to, and, and everything in between? Yeah. Yeah, mate. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I suppose my, my journey into this whole space was, um, very accidental. Um, I wanted to be an AFL player, um, like Jamie, you know, um, but yeah, exactly. Didn't we all? Yeah. Um, you know, my whole life. And, um, I think the, the start of this journey, um, kind of occurred when I, when I found out, you know, that I wasn't, I just wasn't good enough, um, despite how much training I was putting in and, um, all that sort of stuff. And, I, I initially developed um, mental health disorders. So, I, you know, I was, and when I say developed, you know, it was the difference between me walking, walking into a place and being told a label and then, you know, me walking out. But it was a um, whole bunch of things, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic attacks, um, anxiety, um, you know, ADHD was, you know, was prevalent, you know, from an early age. And, um, all of that kind of sparked when the the walls came down and what I was aiming for um, was no longer a, a, um, a realistic target. Like I was saying with, um, you know, trying to make the VFL, let alone make the AFL. Um, and, you know, I suppose the journey to me becoming a counsellor now um, has just been a whole lot of uh, me search, you know, trying to understand my brain more um, and, you know, just, just writing and writing and studying and studying obsessively. So just moving, you know, from obsessive thoughts over here to obsessive thoughts over there. Um, but it became a real love, mate. And I think, you know, that meaning was created because of the amount of effort I was putting into learning more. And as I learned more and applied that to, to my experience, um, things got a hell of a lot better. And um, it became very clear to me that, um, you know, a really great way to market my writing, which is my real baby, um, would be also a great way to, to give back based on the knowledge that I'd, I'd gained from um, reading the books and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, very accidental. Yeah, and uh, you said writing is your real love. Tell us a little bit more around that. Yeah, um, so yeah, so I was writing. I thought I started writing um, kind of seven, eight, nine. But um, speaking to my uncle a couple of couple of months ago, and he was he um, has some stuff uh, from when I was four. So I was always I was always interested in writing and trying to understand the world and my experience a little bit more through writing. Um, you know, when I was ten years old, I wrote like a ten thousand essay about a, a, a young boy with depression. So I was always interested in like the big the big ideas. You know, um, he lost his parents. Wow. What's that? That's some forward thinking. Get into that. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I've tried to I've tried to psychoanalyze, um, you know, the childhood life, and I think you know, for any kid writing about depression, there must have been something going on that I was trying to understand. So it was interesting. But I suppose, like, I mean, you know, even thinking back, my my first memory is is of a panic attack and just like looking at my hands and and going, you know, how the fuck did I get into this body? So, you know, I've always been interested in consciousness and, and the mind, um, but. Uh, yeah, writing for me is a, is a great way for me to understand my thoughts and put them, you know, and, and have them in neat boxes and things. And, um, you know, I was, I was always writing, I was writing blogs and that led to my first book, which was just a recollection of my experience, you know, from 21, uh, well, from childhood really to what culminated in me understanding mental health disorder a little bit more. And hopefully by the end of the year, um, I've, I've made myself recluse and, um, you know, try to just throw myself in a dungeon um, so I can have these two books finished by um, December this year. But uh, they're essentially, one of them's about an existential crisis and how to move through that um, from the neuroscientific, the evolutionary, uh, the spiritual lens. Um, and the other one is um, about awareness and integration. So how to move, how, how to gain awareness. So a deep personal insight and then how to apply that awareness to your life for long lasting change. So, um, I'm hoping to kind of release a package, um, which is called the yes, I'm fine series by the end of the year. So like a limited collector's edition. And, um, so lots of writing ahead, but, um, I love it. Yeah. So your first book you haven't released yet. It's on its way. First book's released. Um, I'll, I will, it's called yes, I'm fine. Just tired. Um, which is obviously an excuse I used to, uh, to say to people, 
Um, that's out on audio and um, you can buy it in hard copy and all that sort of stuff on Kindle. Um, I want to re-release that with these other two books. So the book I'm writing now is Yes, I'm Fine, Just Busy. And the third one, which is in its first draft phase, is um, Yes, I'm Fine, Just Thinking. So I wanted to release it as a Yes, I'm Fine series. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll go back and touch up um, the first book. Um, ju I just, it just needs another, another preface and um, some stuff that I want to hit up to make it um, contextual and relevant because things yeah. have changed since then. I used to host another pot a, a previous podcast and it still has me as the co-host of that podcast, but you know, things have changed. So yeah. <laughs> that podcast, was that the adventure fit podcast? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was good fun. That, who were your co-hosts? So Mac uh, started off with Bill and I. Um, so it was uh, Bill, Mac and I for the first couple of months um, yeah. for Bill's former company, adventure fit travel. Um, so Bill's a, a very dear friend of mine and, um, and so was Mac. Um, you know, Mac and I still chat once a week, even though he lives in Bali. Bill and I chat um, close to once a week. So we're, we really are still best friends, which is awesome. Um, and we did, a, we did a podcast and we were so fortunate to interview some of the people we did. It was unbelievable. Um, we just put everything into it and had loads of fun. And, um, you know, it just went that way that we kind of wanted to do our own stuff. You know, Bill has a separate company now. I have a separate business and, you know, Max doing his hormonal stuff. And um, we've all got our own separate podcast, but we love jumping on each other's show when we can because it's just fucking really fun, man, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I've, I've spent a bit of time with Mac. He's a, he's a fun guy. He's having a good life over there at the moment in Bali. Yeah. A life of no responsibilities. It's, yeah. Uh, looks like a dream. Good on him for, for taking the plunge. I know. Um, now you are a counselor as well. Um, you do that every like every day or a few days a week. How's that rolling out for you? And who are your main clients that you usually see? Just a bit. Of yeah. So yeah. So I work full time as a counselor. Um, you know, I work online, um, which is actually a, a real privilege because I wasn't affected by what's going on at the moment. You know, and I, I really um, am very grateful for that. Um, main clientele I'm seeing at the moment are people that are struggling existentially. Um, you know, especially with what's going on in the world, we're forced into self-reflection and um, that can be tough for people, you know, that, that haven't really, I suppose, you know, um, to use like a Jungian idea, had that kind of psychic energy rise from the unconscious depths. And um, it's just interesting to, to, to kind of how to navigate that. You know, that was a really big, big thing for me, um, losing my um, losing my identity and then losing all touch with the idea of athlete and then going inside. And, um, you know, that's kind of what this second book is all about. But main clientele are people that are struggling to find a sense of meaning in life. Um, and, you know, I take a very practical approach to that. Um, having obsessively studied about meaning, um, cause I was struggling for so long. Um, what, you know, one of the things we do is try to, we use cognitive, you know, reframes, um, you know, little practical insights, you know, just a basic idea that meaning is something that we individually create. It's not something you find under a rock and then, oh, fuck, my life's got purpose, you know. Yeah. Um, it's something you have to create with the amount of effort you put into it. And, um, you know, we work through systematic programs that I offer, um, online consultations as well. But, yeah, aside from that, relationship stuff too, very interested in that sort of thing. Um, but the main one is existential therapy. Great, great. Now, um Let's get into some, some more, um, I guess, funky stuff. Um, along this journey, you've obviously learned a lot about the minds, a lot about um, perceptions of reality, the way people view the world. Uh, where, do you think, um, where do you think you've sort of landed at this point in time in terms of some core principles that you, you have mm. around the development of, of one's, one's uh, thinking patterns, thought patterns, um, their belief systems, how do, how do they evolve into who they are? And once they're there, how can they uh, self-reflect and, and, and see who they are, who they've become? Because quite often, even when I do some of the work that I do with people, uh, it never, invariably we get back to some sort of life coaching kind of um, component where we're trying to help them readjust their life to stop them from continually facing the problems that they're facing. Mm. Albeit a lot of them are physical, but they, are, but they end up navigating back to 
a decision ma- decision making process. They're deciding to not move or move in a particular way or eat in the wrong way or they're putting work in front of their family or family in front of their work and it's creating stress or you know what I mean? So mm. at some point in time they need to be able to look back at themselves, see who they are as an individual, how they've got to that point, and then that's obviously a great place for them to um, to to pivot or change or evolve. So yeah. yeah. Tell us where you've got to with that thinking um, and how you see that evolution happening for people. Yeah, it, it's a really great question. And it's, it's uh, something that's so important for every person to know uh, because, you know, belief systems do um, structure our reality. We each possess an interpretive structure, um, you know, irrespective of the possibility of an objective reality. Um, we can't see it, you know, we are so skewed by, um, subjective experience and, uh, you know, um, molding all that, all of that sort of stuff that it's just, it's almost not even relevant to, you know, despite what the, what the, what the fundamentalist scientific community tries to do. Um, you know, we're trying to have a meaningful experience in life and the best way to do that is to, as you say, start to think for yourself and, um, question those belief systems. But the way I see um, the phenomenological, which is such a hard word for me to say, um, you know, human behavior is that, you know, you're born into this world and you're so, um, you're so dependent on your parents, your mom specifically, especially in the first year. And, um, they really are your everything. You know, you can't see, you know, you can't, there is no ego at that time. There is no prefrontal cortex really in terms of how it's, um, it's evolved. Sorry, mate. I'm a massive fidgeter. <laughs> That's good, mate. I'm fidgeting yeah. in year two with my hair. Yeah, exactly. We're all just, yeah. <laughs> it's like Talladega Nights with Will Fowl, you know? <laughs> exactly. My hands and you're like... <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, so you're so heavily dependent on your parents. They, they are your world. You know, they give you everything, everything in terms of survival. Um, as you start to grow older, you see this, um, and I'm not a parent, but you see this in, in how children kind of behave is that they'll go off and run to the world. Um, and then they'll always be looking back to make sure their mum specifically, their parents are watching them as long as they're watching them, they can go out and explore, but they have that psychological safe space. So they're always moving back to what we call home. And as they get older, they get older, they move into adolescence. And then that's when the group thing starts to happen. So before, adolescence really it's just the world is what the parent says it is and I have my own experience with this I remember you know 9-11 happening and um, at that age I was eight at the time I think um, and at that age because my parents were everything I personally wasn't that affected by it but I was very affected by the fact that mum was affected by what was going on so she was watching the TV trying to understand how planes go into buildings and I was watching mum trying to figure out why mum was so confused. So when you're very young, it's very much what the parent says goes. And that's very deep. You want to talk about a belief system, that's deep as it goes. And then you get older and then you start to spend more time with the, um, with the social group and you slowly detach yourself from the belief systems inherited uh, into the belief systems, um, you know, molded by the social group because we're a social species and we want to fit in, you know, and that can be a really tough time because we often do things that are very disingenuous and, you know, unauthentic because we want to fit in. That's an evolutionary necessity. Um, so that's really, it's a really important consideration. But then your question with regards to becoming a self and, you know, recognizing your own individuality is then how do you attach a, detach again from group think, you know, and, we could have a political discussion about this when you see on the extreme left and the extreme right, these, these people that have an inability to detach themselves from group think, you know? Um, but so much of that, and I really think that, you know, to sum all that self-awareness and um, personal development is very much about deconditioning limiting beliefs. So when you're young, you have this beautiful creative approach to life because everything's novel, you know? Um, you, 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 one of the things that we sacrifice um, as we get older is novelty because we've rendered the world safe and predictable, therefore boring. Um, So we don't see as much as we used to see as a kid. And that obviously was good and bad because we were so dependent upon our parents to keep us safe. But obviously the positive is we just live in this, you know, it's like we've just eaten mushrooms. It's crazy. And as someone that has eaten mushrooms, it is like that. (laughs) Um, 
So it's pretty, it's pretty unbelievable. But then when you get older, you habitualize, you fall into your routines and your patterns, and that creates structure and purpose into your life, but you sacrifice the novelty. So what you want to do as an individual is to start questioning those belief systems by deconditioning those, those, you know, those patterns of behavior. And it starts, you know, the way I would kind of interpret it was, you know, you're trying to go out into a river and sift through the water. You want to make sure you've got a rope tied to a tree so you don't go too far and fall, you know, like and start to question everything. And that's kind of where my work comes into it with helping people, you know, I suppose, um, move from nihilism. Like what's the point of anything, you know, because we do need some grounding and routine and structure. Um, but then we also need to be questioning. So it's a very gradual approach. And I, the, the best where I started and the best way to start, I believe is, um, open, honest communication with someone that is going to tell you um, how it is, um, and um, and journaling as well. Just just following the hand and, and seeing, you know, kind of what comes up. Because if you're having a, a, a conversation with yourself, it's going to be very interesting, and you're probably going to get to know yourself a little better. <laughs> so that's a very long-winded approach. No, no, no. That's a great approach. You, you, you touched on a couple of things. I think are really interesting too. Like. This, this idea of evolution versus um, like transfixing as, or, like, or transport, transporting to another reality. So, you know, the, the group think and, and you, you talked about getting out of the group think to sort of some, some sort of self-actualization. Um, but what happens, and you see this, sometimes people have some kind of revelation where they're like, the world I'm living in is not um, what I thought it was. Then they look around and find another world that seems to fit them more, but then get stuck back into that group think. So they never mm. haven't actually self actualized, haven't become an independent thinker. They've just, they've transported themselves from one group to another to live in a new, a new dimension, a new reality, but it's, it's still suffering from the same, same sort of, um, I guess, uh, downfalls, um, mm. of that group think. But then the other thing is probably why people I find do that is that, um, that rope analogy is a ripper. I love using the word um, tethered, being, remaining tethered mm. to yourself at all times because you don't want to, who you are all the way through your journey is still who you are. And, mm-hmm. and you don't want to let go of any of that. You just need to remain, you need to remain tethered to it, but evolve to the direction that you want to go, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, that's cool. I love that, that rope analogy. I'll probably, I'll probably um, steal that off you, mate. You know, yeah, no, nah, absolutely. It's, it's not mine. I probably just heard it somewhere, but yeah, <laughs> it, ma- it makes a lot of sense to me for sure. <laughs> um, now with this, um, with this, the work that you're doing with this idea of, uh, of people um, getting to know who they are more, I find this probably one of the most interesting things, even myself, like I've, I've done some journaling, I did some journaling recently when the, when coronavirus first sort of came into Australia, um, believe it or not, um, I just happened to go to the Albert Park Hotel the night that the, like one of the first cases we had, there was a guy in there. And I was, oh. like, all I did was walk into the front door, ask the doorman um, when the actual opening night was, cause it was a soft opening and then walked out. And in the 30 seconds I was there, someone who sort of matched the description of the guy who had it walked past me and coughed right next to me. Right. Oh shit. Wow. Then, like, then on the Tuesday night, I read this, that was on a Saturday. Then I started getting the whole psychosomatic. Oh, I've got to sort yeah. of what's going on, you know? Um, and we'll probably touch on that in a second too, because I've yeah. thoughts on some of this. And then uh, I had a test and it was all clear. But in the time that I had to wait, uh, we, were, we were also moving house. So I could drive from one house to the other and remain in isolation technically because I, I wasn't interacting with anyone to bring stuff over. But when I was driving, I had this really weird sensation come across me like I was living in the new world and everything mm. that I was seeing outside the car was the old world. Um, mm. it, it, and, and being in the moment of evolution of time, you know, as a species, mm. um, because we are like, things are going to be different after the, off the back of this, no doubt. Totally. Um, but yeah, that, that um, ability for people to see is something that I'm really interested in. Like I, I'm sure when you do work, you have people that you work with and you're trying to help them understand or see what's happening or see how they're creating their own outcomes. Um, what are some of the tools that you use <clears throat> to try and get people to be able to, to do that? Like to yeah. try and be as effective of looking in the mirror, you know? Um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's a great, yeah, it's, this is like depth psychology, you know, and um, it's such a fantastic conversation. And to your, to, to your experience, um, 
you know, it sounds like you move through something akin to what's called depersonalization or like a derealization where it's like you, you, you see the world of experience, um, but you're kind of like behind this glass wall where it, everything is kind of like happening to you and you're almost developing like a solipsistic mindset where everything you see is an extension of your own consciousness. And that is um, one of the prerequisites to, you know, um, schizophrenia. Is, um, which is so interesting as well because the Hindus talk about how we are all one and yet that liberates them from their suffering. So I've, I've been, I'm really interested in that idea, but, you know, it's that everything's happening to me or we are all one approach. Anyway, you can talk about that for a while. <laughs> um, when we move through, um, you know, existential change, the reason for it, unfortunately, is often because we have no choice. So what happened to you is someone coughed at me that matched the description of someone who was positive. Therefore, these things are probably going to happen. And the exact same, um, I write about the exact same thing. The anecdote that I use is that a, a, a loving um, mother and a wife um, comes home to find her husband cheating on her in the book. And um, basically what I'm, what I'm talking about that and what's happening to you is that who I am is no longer possible. I'm not, I can't be that person anymore. You know, I can never look at my husband the same. I might die, you know, to just go crazy on, on your experience. Yeah. So there is a deep pain that forces us to change who we are. And so often when we are trying to move through change, people get depressed circumstantially because they don't have enough motivation, you know, and, and there's a really great book called Affective Neuroscience, which talks about, um, you know, motivation in mammals. And there are only two systems there. It's pain and pleasure. We run to pleasure and we run away from pain. And oftentimes when we're not changing and we're lost and existential and potentially depressed, it's because those frames aren't explicit enough. So what we need to do is either, you know, if we want to change, so sometimes people want to change and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. So the why needs to be stronger. It's like, well, who do you want to be? What's your idea of a point B? And that's really powerful because it means they're willing to embrace change, which can be very scary because change is also very novel. And when, when we, uh, things are changing around us, anything could be potentially anxiety provoking or dangerous. So we don't like change. That's why we don't like change from an evolutionary standpoint. What you're talking about is um, the pain side of things. I don't want to change, but I can't be that person anymore because my husband's cheating on me. I've caught him in the act. I don't want to change, but I can't be that person anymore because I might have coronavirus. And what's so interesting in the model in the in the in the modern mental health world is that we view anxiety as a bad thing, but it's actually evolved to motivate us to get the fuck away from a saber tooth tiger or from a bear. So we harness it for its power. And one of the things I get people to do is to journal about how bad, you know, their life is. And that's a tough, sort of, a, a tough pill to swallow. But under my guidance, you know, this is something that really worked effectively for me. Under my guidance, it's like, hey, you know, we're using this so that we are getting to a more desirable place. It's not just a bad you, bad you. It's we're, we're trying to get you to, um, to make, you know, the changes that you want to make. Well, yeah, you've got to understand where that where that's rising up from within you for, and what yeah. reason is like that because it's not, um, you know, anxiety, I, I kind of use this phrase, you know, anxiety doesn't happen to you, it happens from you, you know, um, and that from you is multi-layered, you know, and it's yeah. obviously based upon um, who you are in the past, like your evolution as an individual, your filters and how you view the world, then you've got to relate that to your, your current exposures. Like how bad are they? Why do you react to this versus someone who doesn't react to it and who, mm. you know, all that stuff. And, and clearly, um, you know, I don't do cancelling like you do. So we keep, I keep these conversations to a certain level and then handball them on to the people in my practice who, <laughs> who yeah. deal with this um, more often. But yeah, I find it is that I've, I have been interested in this myself, having a number of people close to me suffer mental health um, problems along the journey and, and figuring out how that has come about like what what mm. what part of their life has led them down this path which is i had a question that come to me then but it um it sort of escaped me but it's just come back again which is good <laughs> um, a lot of the people who are, who i deal with or who listen to this podcast are really interested in optimal performance uh, um health and well-being and so um mm. they if we think about it like going down a road 
they're he- they're, everyone's heading down a road at some point and quite often um, people derail, go off the road, crash. We can use any one sort of analogy and then they'll end up in our office for some crisis care. You know, they might come and see someone like you to try and get that help that they require. But yeah. obviously if we can stop them from getting that point, it's even better. Mm. Um, what, what resources and um, ideas do you have for people that are sitting at home thinking or sitting in their car or wherever they're listening to this going, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about my life, but how do I really know that I, this is the best life I could be living? Like what can I do to make sure that I stay ahead of the curve, that um, around the corner there isn't some, something that's going to upset me or derail me? Uh, and I can use my own personal experience for this. I'm not sure we've ever talked about this in the podcast, but the first, when I was 28, I was going to buy a practice. There was a girl I thought I was going to marry. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in my life. It was all heading in one direction. We broke up. The practice I was going to buy, that didn't eventuate. Um, in a really funny kind of analogy, all the floor was rotting in there, termites. There's a whole bunch of other wow. stuff. And so like, everything that was my direction sort of just went away. Mm. And then for a long time, I, I've done a lot of work in the positive you know, self-help arena and you read stuff, you, you fill your mind with all this stuff that's meant to help you in those sort of circumstances. And I was working on myself a lot, but just couldn't get past a certain point. Um, I wasn't really down, but I, just, I was less effective than I had previously been. Mm. Um, and I went to my therapist and he, made me, he helped me see things from a different perspective. He helped me realize that prior to that, I'd always expected to get a good result. Yeah, um, I'm well at uni. Um, I didn't get drafted, but you know, I'd, I'd had a reasonably good junior sort of footy career and played VFL and whatever. Pro- and then, yep, much better than me. <laughs> uh, so then we go. Then you, you, then you get to this point where you're like, all of a sudden, stuff disappears. I'd never faced mm. times like that, right? So then my, I hadn't developed skills um, mm. to be able to navigate that situation. So I'm going along. I go around a corner. Bang! I hit this problem. Now, as a person, I hadn't, I hadn't realized. It took me like 18 months to realize that I hadn't developed those skills because I never had to, had, had to develop in that point. I mm. saw the guy that helped me push forward. But ideally, if you can identify some of these traits beforehand, then um, when you are faced with these challenges, you can then um, move through it easier um, as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, long, really long question there, but I'll bring it back nah. to the original what can people do who are already functioning really well, believe that they're, they're really on top of things, but want to make sure that they actually are? How can they self-reflect and, and what tools and resources are available for them, you reckon? Yeah. So, or who can they listen to? You know, there they may not be a specific tool or who do people that you think would be good for them to also. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I really love uh, if you can take a psychological perspective from the spiritual teachings there's just so much knowledge entrenched in those ideas that's why they've lasted for thousands of years you know um and um i i i personally really love buddhism because the 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 first thing buddhism says when you come across it is that there is suffering in life you know and for a western individual who's um you know, built up around the idea of pursuing happiness. That's a very weird thing to read. It's just like, what? (laughs) You know, but I can order order, order Uber Eats whenever I want. I can watch a movie whenever I want, you know? Like, it doesn't make any sense that life is not only bad, but it's terrible. Like, it's real, it's suffering, you know? Um, But it's a really interesting take to look at life on the other side. Um, Jordan Peterson in that in there isn't really yes yes he's 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 so big on that idea yep absolutely um I really love Jordan Peterson and I I love um you know um Achea Eliad um Joseph Campbell a lot of these um people that talk about um comparative mythology you know I'm really big on those they they really helped me because I I a lot of my OCD was around um you know I was raised a Catholic but I was never really very much into it, but I developed this obsessive thinking that I would um, go to hell and burn in hell and be tormented by demons. I I have no idea where that would come from, Um, but it would plague on my mind and I would have to pick up rubbish to prove to God that I was being a good person and um, transcending a belief like that took me a long time. Um, So that was, yeah, so kind of going back and that was really scary to then, you know, read religion because that's exactly what I was running away from. and I'm not really particularly religious now at all. You know, um, I just love the books, but, yeah. um, 
to, to, to your point, you know, how can we, because obviously then, um, in life, tragedies do occur and things like what happened to you happen and tragedy is subjective. And, you know, my identity was literally AFL. Um, and I had ignorantly made it my identity, you know, without actually taking in the truth that it probably wasn't going to happen. And then when I was told that I was cut, you know, I didn't, I didn't listen to the, we'd love you to come back next year. I listened to it. We're not going to offer you a place this year. And it just broke me. Um, so, and tragedies do, do happen. And a tragedy like that was because of my own naivety, you know? So sometimes in life, things like that happen and there actually is, there's only so much you can do. Um, but then life is also about picking up the pieces and re-navigating, which also gives us meaning. So when, when I talk to people about this sort of stuff, like how can we, you know, prevent this sort of stuff from happening? Sometimes it's inevitable that it's going to happen, but what we can do to be ready is to try to look at our blind spots all the time. And um, some of that is to do with, gaining awareness, you know? So, um, like I said, journaling, open, honest conversations. Um, you know, what are some other ones that I, that I write about? Um, you know, I think therapy is something that a lot of people should do. You know, the, the, even the word itself is like, you're training your mind, you know, you're trying to get better. It's not like you don't have to have a problem. You've got to go there to get good. You know, it's the same thing as doing CrossFit cause I used to be a CrossFit coach, you know? Um, but gaining awareness, um, is, is probably the best way self-awareness, you know? Um, and there's so many tools that we can access online now, even just YouTube, like how to, how to get more self-awareness. Yeah. Go for it. Go for your life. You know, <laughs> it's actually a really good point. The whole therapy thing is something that's really interesting. And, um, I've done some work with Nadra who works for, for in our practice. She's a psychologist and, uh, I've told her to watch billions. I'm not sure that you've ever watched the TV show billions. Oh, I've heard of it. Yeah. 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 And, um, so it's all about this this guy Bobby Axelrod who, who runs like an investment capital sort of you know venture capitalist firm whatever investment company. Yeah, yeah. He has a psychologist who works for him, but she has these really short, sharp consults. You know, like a minute, a couple of minutes to basically break someone down. Like she obviously already understands who they are, and then try and rewire their thinking in the moment to perform. You know, so it's yep. um, her. It's not really a like a, a therapy session lay on the couch tell me all your problems and woes it's more hey well this is who you are this is why you're feeling this way if you want to get the result you're after this is who you need to become right now right and then mm. i feel like therapy is not utilized in the best possible way because it's after mm. the fact. it's a bit like um you know um someone coming to crossfit because they they want to lose weight you know what i mean like yep. after the fact again versus and i mean crossfit's probably a poor example because it has a pretty good um, preventative and performance culture, but you know, going to the gym or like s someone going on a diet after they've already eaten themselves to be obese, you know, like yeah, we need people to be taking up um, better action steps from a health and wellness perspective beforehand. And therapy is probably overlooked a little bit because if we mm. think about the concept that's kind of thrown around, you know, eat well, move well, think well, you know, people, the the nutrition industry is loaded, you know, the yeah. Um, the movement industry is loaded. Uh, yes, we have a lot of people dealing with the mental health space, but a lot of that is, is steered in the direction of helping people after they've, you know, it's the ambulance to the bottom of the cliff um, mm. stuff rather than the barrier up the top. And we really need people to be engaging earlier. So that was, mm. a, I love that, that you brought that point up. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, see, that's when the, the why comes into it as well, because, you know, you say something to someone like, Oh, you know, you got to eat well, move well, think well. Um, you know, as I, as I said before, like pain is such a good motivator. And when your life's just tragic mess, you can only go up and you have to go up because you can't go anywhere and you just absolutely wrecked, you know? So it's like, I have to do something about my life right now. But then you can also engage motivation in the opposite direction. And um, it's like, how could, how good could your life be? You know, like some of the stuff you were saying before. And um, the, the way I approach it is... Um, very simple. It's just, what do you want your life to be like in six months time? People yeah. say, Oh, I want to have, you know, more happiness and meaning. It's like, no, 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 no. Specific outcome. Like how do you want to wake up? Do you want to wake up next to someone and cuddle them and kiss them? Uh, make love with them. Do you want to get a coffee then? And like, what do you want a specific day to look like if it was the best day in the world? And then that 
can be a strong enough why to get people to act and, and, and do things that are better for them. And it's, it's really interesting because um, <clears throat> this conversation is flowing some really cool parts. I often, uh, when I've talked to people around this in the past, we talk about th- like being congruent with who you are because sometimes people chase, you know, like, what do you want in six months? I want to be in a relationship, for instance. They may then end up selecting someone just to be in a relationship that's not yeah. necessarily the right person because they're not really, they're not really making that from a, a core belief system um, decision-making process they're more worried around the timeline. But I get obviously mm. the point is you need to be clear on what you want, right? You need to be objective. You need to, but um, we want. I always try and get that, get people to realise that you have to be, um, you have to be taking actions, but also be aware if it's not the right action. So you yep. can take different actions straight after. So yeah, you might wake up with someone six months time that you've been seeing for a month or whatever, and you might go, you know what, this isn't the right one. I'll have yeah. to- I'll move the goalposts forward a little bit, you know. Um, yeah, she's then, not even alive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you just need to keep taking action steps, but also re continue checking in on yourself, and that's where the journaling comes into play as well, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, it's like a re-navigation tool um, for sure, man. It's um, that's a thing, and I think like a a really shitty plan is better than no plan because. If, if we're just in our heads all the time and we're just thinking, then, you know, the world is just infinite possibility and it, we, we drown in that stuff. And um, if we, we take one path, it could be the worst path we've got to take, but at least now we know. And life is just a really big kind of trial and error thing. Yeah, love that. Love that. Because that, it's true, right? Um, you know, I, I can't even remember the right phrase around the inaction, but you know, it, it has like that has to be one of the most crippling things that happens to people is you know they're paralysed with fear of taking any steps forward. Um, yeah, which is which is no good. Now, mm. um, where can people find you? Because we'll we'll sort of um, uh, where are we at here with this? Yeah, I think we'll. That, I don't really have any more questions. I think we could get real heavy. If we might do. We a went deep. We might have to do a yeah. fun, um, another time. Um, yeah as well because i'm sure people want to know uh, more around what you do um you, you're doing some great videos um i just want to plug one of your videos it was i'm not sure what you've done none since but you, you did one in the past week that was talking about dopamine and serotonin yep um i reckon people should jump on and have a look at that in specifically related to what we were just talking about in terms of taking action and getting yourself going in a positive direction getting the right feedback. Mm involved in your life um, through taking that action is a really good good thing and that video will help so that was on Instagram so tell people your yeah, Instagram handle yeah it's just uh, Tom dot Ahern um, Tom dot A-H-E-R-N with the Irish background there yeah. <laughs> um, I love that when you were talking to Barry too he's obviously Irish isn't he Barry yes yeah, yeah. I met up with him actually um, for a coffee when, when my partner and I were over there so that was good fun too because that book helped me that was the first book that I really read um, and I got so much from it that I read it like 10 times. And then I was just like, well, information is out there. And I just buried my head for six years, <laughs> made no friends. <laughs> oh, hello, mate. I look at you now. You're flying. Um, so just ball, got a ball patch here, but yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, um, that was on your podcast. So that we're talking about and that Bar- Barry McDonough, he, his book was called, um, dare. Is it dare? Yeah. Yep. Um, so um, that's the book you're referencing there. That podcast, is it yep. number two of your podcast, I think? I think it is. I think it's one of the earlier ones, yeah. So um, the name of your podcast for people, if they want to jump the, on. Yes, so it's the the Mind Mate podcast. There's a picture of me taking a mask off. So Yeah, that's great. And then the little, do you remember what the little tag <laughs> one is that you have underneath it? Um, on, on- uh, yeah, well, I suppose the whole idea behind it is just get to know yourself. Yeah. Um, and that's the idea. And, you know, um, it's something that came to my mind, you know, it's just kind of like the more you spend time with yourself, the more you'll get to know yourself. And that, I think that's really important. You know, that's not my idea at all. Socrates was saying that shit thousands of years ago. Yeah. yeah those old guys are pretty good. Hey, like, uh, they were good. I love reading. There's a book by Seneca called, um, on the shortness of life. Have you read that? I've not read it. I've heard of that one. Yeah. A hundred pages, but it's like gold, I reckon. Um, yeah. And mate, the Stoics knew it. Oh mate. When you read that book, I read that book and at the end of it, I, I thought to myself, times have changed, stuff has changed, mm. people are the same. Right? Yeah, um, so true. Those guys, they were all over it um, back then. Um, but yeah, so, um, so true. hi mate, 
Um, it's a great, and I think that's really interesting in that if you do want to know yourself, listening to people like you, interviewing other people who are working in this space, and just naturally pulls out information and perceptions out of our brains around our own reality and who we are and what we're doing. So um, get on board and listen to the mind, mate. Um, it's- <laughs> Thank you, mate. Well, I mean, I mean, the, the biggest reason why I had that tagline is so I never um, – forget that all I know right now is as much as I know. And, you know, I would hate to look back on this interview in two years time and think, um, Oh yeah, that's still who I am, you know, because I haven't learned anything. And, you know, I could have said some things in this interview that are so wrong and it's so drastically not right. And, you know, my goal with therapy and counseling, the more I understand about the mind is, you know, the more I can help because my depth of perception, you know, perception increases, um, and um, that means facing my fear and, you know, diving into the shame swamp lands. And, you know, I, I use writing to, to get that stuff out. And, you know, I'm, I would just hate to, to, to not learn because it's, you know, I'm so I'm proportionally happier and, um, you know, I'm with someone who I really love and I'm in a much happier place than I was then. So I would hope that the same happens in another five years time. Yeah, well, it's great. And I, I, there's this phrase that says uh, the same river never runs over the same bed twice. Um, which is true, right? The world's always evolved. Yeah. Things always change. And as things change as a human species, we have to learn from it and evolve as well. So mm. what's true today is not going to be true tomorrow or the next day. It's always changing. So um, we should never timestamp anything as, as, with, as being the truth. Um, yeah. The truth, the truth is always what's next, I guess, really. Yeah. Subjective, which sucks. <laughs> yeah. Two plus two is 19, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, mate, thanks for jumping on the, on the podcast. Um, it's great to have you as a guest. We'll definitely do a follow-up another time. Um, maybe, yeah, it was awesome, man. Uh, maybe around when you, when you launch your books, um, back on and, and have a chat about those. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, just, just go over um, the name of the books again, the name of your book that you've already released, where the people can find that, and then also where your books are going to be, what they're going to be called. Where yep. they come out and where people should be following you to make sure that they can stay up to date. Yeah, cool. I mean, I suppose I'm most active on Instagram and um, and the podcast world. So just if you look up the Mind Mate podcast um, or Tom Dotterhern, you, you'll find me. Um, but uh, yeah, the book that's currently out now is Yes, I'm Fine, Just Tired. Um, the book I'm third draft now um, is Yes, I'm Fine, Just Busy. And then, and that's all about identity and the malleability of identity. It's something we construct. And then the third one is, yes, I'm fine. Just thinking, which is, um, and I suppose the subtitle of that is, um, application of personal insight. Right. Amazing. Yeah. Good fun. Wicked. Wicked. Keeps me going. Ah, oh, mate. Well, that's it. I mean, what an interesting life. Uh, getting your thoughts down would be, uh, I've, it's the real blessing for me in this time period is mm. I would do something like what you're doing. And um, that's one thing I definitely took out of listening to your podcast the other day as well, was really rejoicing the fact that I've got an opportunity to do something that I've wanted to do for ages. So, um, Mm. you know, uh, good on you for going down this path. Mate, thank and thank you for so I, I love um, it's so interesting being on the other side of the podcast because I'm normally the one doing the doing the question, but it's so fun, man. I loved it. Yeah, we we um we'd have a good couple of beers, I think, and a coffee. I think we caught up. So we'll have to do that when all this um when all this stops. Once ISO is finished, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we'll catch up with the big tree, Jamie, and uh, we'll have a <laughs> have a sesh. Mate, the big tree, <laughs> seriously, on his new bike. Have you seen? Yes. That? <laughs> Mate, that has to be the big, the world's biggest bike to be able to come. I know. <laughs> I know it's a Ferris wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Couple of Ferris wheels stuck. <laughs> yeah, right down uh, St Kilda Boulevard. <laughs> no, he's a good man. We love him. We love him, Jamie. Love Cheddar. <laughs> All right, mate. I'll, uh, I'll speak to you another time soon. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks, mate.